Hi, welcome to this special show. This show is exclusive for the very special students of class 10th of the CBSE stream. We have with us two eminent politicians of our country. Dear students, please welcome Mr. Krishna and Mrs. Sonia to this show. They are here to share their experiences and important concepts of democratic politics. Mr. Krishna, could you please throw some light on what is in store for us? We have studied in the earlier chapters that power sharing is important in democracy and power is shared in various forms. Those who are in power cannot enjoy unlimited power in democracy. They are constrained both by the existing constitution and active participation of the citizens. You are aware of how people in India are participating in the movement against corruption. This movement has become famous as India Against Corruption. It is natural that a democratic country has varied opinions on any given issue. There are diverse aspirations as well. Those who are in power are required to balance these conflicting demands and pressure. These struggles around conflicting demands and pressures shape democracy. In fact they strengthen democracy and take it to the next level. Let's understand this with the help of two examples. One of Nepal, where people organized a movement for the restoration of democracy and the other, of Bolivia, where people organized a struggle to claim their rights against an existing democratic rule. Miss Sonia, could you please throw light on a bit of history? and the events that led to popular struggle in Nepal for the restoration of democracy? Well, Nepal is one of the third wave countries. That is, it is one of the countries that accepted democracy in the later part of the 20th century. It had monarchy earlier. It became a democratic country in 1990. King Virendra helped in the smooth transition of the country from monarchy to democracy. Though he remained the constitutional head of the state, all powers were transferred to the democratically elected representatives. Everything was hunky-dory for a few years. The King Birenda was killed in a mysterious massacre of the royal family in 2001. Here is the image of King Birenda for you. After this incident, political situation in Nepal probably was thrown out of gear. You guessed it right. In this mayhem, Jyanendra became the king of Nepal. The democratically elected government was losing popularity among the citizens. The king, on the other hand, wanted to get all powers back and reinstall monarchy. In February 2005, the king dismissed the prime minister and dissolved the parliament. Monarchy was back in Nepal again. People organized themselves to fight against this injustice. A spontaneous movement broke out in Nepal for the restoration of democracy. How did the people achieve their goal? Let's watch a video of the movement first. Then we will discuss it in detail. At the temple of Pashaputanath, Hindu pilgrims send their dead to the spiritual world. The people of Nepal recall the day not so long ago when nine members of their royal family were dispatched from here. Now, the survivors of that regal dynasty have melted away. long lived the royals. They've been absolute rulers here for most of the last 240 years. But what's happened in Nepal in the last few months has been a revolution in every sense of the word. Banished as the world's only Hindu monarch, driven from the palace by his own subjects. The Nepalese were fed up with the king who saw himself as a god. You've chucked them out of the palace. 
there is there is not any sympathy among the masses uh, to the monarchy now the Nepalese are under the spell of a new leader who compares himself with some of history's most notorious megalomaniacs he's a man whose message seems irresistible even though he's responsible for the deaths of thousands of his own people we could be heading for a lot of trouble we could even be heading for a civil war i don't know The breathtaking beauty of the Annapurna range masks a shocking event that was largely unreported in the outside world. The people here had lived in peace for generations. And yet one night in early 2004, they turned on each other with incredible brutality. It was a human wave attack, which is a strategy they had perfected. Uh, you go in with lots of uh, villagers shouting slogans and, you know, with flaming torches. I mean, actually out in the open, just to uh, put psychological pressure on the defenders. The village of Beni had been surrounded by 5,000 men and women ragtag fighters. Like every other operation, the attack was to be filmed for propaganda purposes. They were followers of the doctrine of Chinese revolutionary Chairman Mao. Their quest was a communist takeover of Nepal. Over the next 10 hours, police posts and government buildings were attacked and dozens of officials murdered. The fighting uh, went on all night. So the idea was to attack, paralyze the government machinery, um, give a very big blow to the morale of the, of the security forces guarding the district uh, headquarters and then move out. The Maoist tactics were employed in dozens of attacks across Nepal in a 10-year insurgency. Today the police station at Beni has been rebuilt. The town bears few scars, although the people still suffer. Yes, this is the district office. Krishna Lal Shrestha was a caretaker on that night when mortars rained from the sky. The Maoist insurgency was to change Nepal forever. It was to be the beginning of the end of the monarchy. King Gainendra suspended parliament and wound back democratic reforms. He had now turned other moderate Nepalese people against him. Uh, it's a shelter for around 20 girls. Right now we have around uh, 17 and most of the kids are from difficult backgrounds. In one of the poorest and least developed nations on earth, Pramada Shaha takes me to a children's shelter run by her welfare agency. Either they've been displaced by the conflict or they've lost parents or some of them have been abused themselves or they're victims of domestic violence. So they come from different backgrounds and some of them are just pure and simple needy. Uh, you know, what they would and there's something else she's known for. Pramada Shaha is a member of the former royal family, having married King Gyanendra's nephew. Whenever I thought of sovereignty, I thought of the monarchy. And uh, the people, I think, did look at them as a you know, foundation of security for Nepal being Nepal. Now, at this point, I'm not even sure we are going to be Nepal. The Maoists were intent on destroying the monarchy, but the family were doing a good job of that themselves. Gyanendra had only come to power after his brother the king was shot dead, along with eight other royals, on one night in 2001. 
The gunman was the king's own son, a drunken Crown Prince Dipendra, upset because he couldn't marry the woman he loved. Dipendra turned the weapon on himself and died two days later. I mean, he had threatened to do this, and he actually, when he actually did it, then he realized, my God, maybe we should have taken him seriously, but no one takes such threats seriously, I guess. In the countryside, the Maoist insurgency was taking hold. Children were taken away to re-education camps, their headmasters murdered. Anyone who didn't think the same way as the Maoists was executed. Behind them was a shadowy and enigmatic figure, so mysterious, rumours suggested he didn't actually exist. But he was real, and he called himself Prachanda, meaning the Fierce One. When I met him in Kathmandu, he told me he never actually fought himself. It turned out that the man calling every shot of Nepal's class war was a snappy dressing middle class teacher and father of three. Meetings. Well, it's 2008. Do you think what the world really needs now is another communist country? Right now, we are not fighting for socialism or communism, as some people think like that. Just we are fighting against feudalism to establish a democratic republic. But 13,000 of your own countrymen and women have died. That's some price to pay, isn't it? These 30,000 people, although we are very uh, sorry for that, but we feel that in comparison in, in, with the history to, uh, uh, to fight against the feudalism, it is not a high price, you know. Critical feeling. The monarchy was the symbol of feudalism and autocracy and we wanted to have a democratic republic uh, to empower the masses of people, you know, there are so many uh, kinds of oppression was there. So generally optimistic for this country or pessimistic? A bit of both I would say at the moment. I really feel sad that one has to, you know, come to this position by stepping on the lives of 13,000 people. After two and a half centuries, the survivors of the ruling Shaha dynasty have passed on into a life of civilian obscurity. Their demise was as much their own making as the onslaught of Maoists who won influence first by the gun then by the ballot box. From this kingdom in the clouds comes the world's newest republic. You have just watched how people participated in the popular struggle in Nepal. Before we begin to analyze the people's participation, let's recall the two major types of governance that are there in the world. One of course is democracy, and the other is communism. You know what democracy is. You probably know that, in communism, every factor of production is controlled by the government. That is, all the sectors of economy are under the direct control of the government. Thus, there are serious ideological differences between democracy and communism. They are two parallel lines that never meet. But for a change, they met for the first time in Nepal, with the sole intention of dethroning the monarch. There were both pro-democratic parties and communist parties in Nepal. Seven such political parties formed an alliance called the Seven Party Alliance. Let's call that SPA henceforth. Well, this SPA consisted also of the Communist Party of Nepal. They were nice. That is, they were influenced by the ideology of Mao Zedong of China. The SPA called for a four-day strike in the capital Kathmandu. Soon this strike became an indefinite strike. Various other organizations also joined the strike. There were clashes between the king's forces and the people, especially the communist forces. About 13,000 people were killed. The SPA served an ultimatum to the king. On 21st of April, 
there were more than three lakhs of people on the streets of Kathmandu. The SPA rejected the half-hearted concessions made by the king. The SPA stuck to its demands. The demands were, 1. Restoration of the parliament. 2. Transfer of power to an all-party government. And, 3. Formation of a new constituent assembly. Unable to withstand such a pressure, the king, on 24th of April, agreed to all the demands of the SPA. The power was transferred to an all-party alliance, and a new constituent assembly was formed. This struggle came to be known as Nepal's second movement for democracy. Elections were held in 2008. Out of 564 elected representatives, 560 voted to form a new government. A coalition government was formed. The king was asked to vacate his palace. All his positions were taken back. He was reduced to the status of an ordinary man. But, power-sharing battles have been going on, among the communist parties, to this date. Since 2008, Nepal has seen four prime ministers. It required a lot of bloodshed to overthrow monarchy in Nepal. The struggle in Nepal was against non-democratic rule. Mr. Krishna, was it the same case with Bolivia? No, it's different. The struggle in Bolivia, famous as the Water War of Bolivia, was against the existing democratic rule. It was against a particular government policy which affected the people the wrong way. Let's watch a video of it first, and then, discuss the issues in detail. Prospect that two-thirds of the world's population will have no access to first drinking water by 2025 has provoked the initial confrontations in a worldwide battle for control over the planet's most basic resource. When Bolivia sought to refinance the public water service of its third largest city, the World Bank required that it be privatized, which is how the Bechtel Corporation of San Francisco gained control over all of Cochabamba's water, even that which fell from the sky. Esta ley, este contrato, prohibían a la gente acumular el agua de la lluvia. Por lo tanto, el agua de la lluvia también se privatizaba. La factura de agua le daba un valor legal a la empresa para que pueda apropiarse de su, de su propiedad, de su vivienda, rematando la misma. La gente debía eh, optar por una decisión de comer menos, pagar del agua, pagar por los servicios básicos, dejar de mandar a los niños a la escuela, eh, no asistir a los hospitales y curarse en la propia casa, o en todo caso, eh, gente jubilada, por ejemplo, que tiene una renta muy, muy baja, debería eh, buscar trabajo en las calles. Con la consigna de el agua es nuestra carajo, la gente sale a las calles, sale a los caminos y eh, protesta. ¿no? The price this beleaguered country paid for World Bank loans was the privatization of the state oil industry and its airline, railroad, electric, and phone companies. But the government failed to convince Bolivians that water is a commodity like any other. Entonces, eh, ahí sí eh, vimos eh, que el gobierno defendía los intereses de la transnacional Bechtel porque la gente quería agua, no gases. La gente quería justicia y no balas. Estas son las imágenes que reflejan definitivamente la situación que vivió Cochabamba durante la jornada de este viernes. Prácticamente estuvo sitiada. Policías del departamento... Bolivia was determined to defend the corporation's right to charge families living on two dollars a day, as much as one quarter of their income for water. The greater the popular resistance to the water privatization scheme, the more violent became the standoff. Y por eso vieron centenares de heridos jóvenes que 
a sus 16, 17 años perdieron brazos, perdieron piernas, quedaron paralíticos, quedaron lesionados de la cabeza de por vida y murió mmm, Víctor Hugo Daza. Cochabamba, Bolivia. It has been nine years since this city was turned upside down over the privatization of their water supply, but to them it was just yesterday. In an attempt of debt relief by the Bolivian government, it leased their municipal water supply to the sole bidder, Bechtel Enterprise Holdings, for $2.5 billion for 40 years. Under this contract, Bechtel was guaranteed an annual return of 15%. The people of Cochabamba experienced rate hikes as high as 200% and on average 35%. While seemingly small to some, many people of Bolivia only earn around $100 per month and their water bill was in excess of $20 per month. These rate hikes led to massive demonstrations and protests by the Bolivian people. For several months, thousands protested. At one point, this city was shut down for four days, putting all economic activity to a halt. Roadblocks were built, blocking most of the major highways throughout Bolivia. Many clashes involving protesters and police and troops occurred. A wage dispute arose between police officers and their superiors, prompting them to disobey commands. On April 9th of 2000, 800 striking police officers fired tear gas on Bolivian soldiers. Not too far from here, near Achacachi, soldiers opened fire at a roadblock demonstration, killing two people, including a teenage boy. The angry residents overpowered the soldiers, using their own weapons against them. The demonstrators went to the local hospital and drugged the army captain out of bed and then beat and dismembered his body. Soon, Bolivian coca workers joined demonstrators, while the Bolivian teachers demanded salary increases who made only a thousand dollars a year. With these continued demonstrations and protests, a televised recording of a Bolivian army captain opening fire upon a crowd, killing a student with a shot to the face, only intensified anger. After four days of hiding, the union leader, Oscar Oliveira, led 125 protesters to San Francisco, where the headquarters of Bechtel was located, in order to quash the water lease. By January of 2006, a settlement had been reached. In the end, there were hundreds of arrests, dozens of injuries, and five deaths. And today, there are hundreds of thousands of people without water here in Cochabamba, while many more only have water for four hours a day. In the words of Benjamin Franklin, when the well is dry, we know the value of water.